I've been talking about the importance of social capital, the networks and norms of cooperation, reciprocity, trust, and trustworthiness that help to build strength in a social organization, that make it more stable, more capable of surviving and adapting to change, and also that enable it to accomplish things. Whatever tasks it sets itself, it's going to be easier to fulfill those tasks if there's a lot of social capital. But that raises an important question. How do we build social capital? What are the factors that contribute to or detract from social capital? And then, once we've recognized some of the key factors, how do we actually go about building it in our organizations? How do we actually use that knowledge of factors to try to change them in such a way that social capital is encouraged and, over time, constructed? It's an important question, I think, within organizational ethics, and really in general, for thinking about how people function in groups. Because after all, we want not only to be able to construct these groups that function well and accomplish a lot and are stable over time, but also we want people to behave in ways that contribute to social capital. And so it's important from an ethical point of view to think, look, part of what it is to be a good person is to be a good member of a group. And that is, in many cases, going to mean being a member of the group that contributes to its social capital. So how is it possible to, in general, build social capital? And what should people do? That is to say, managers of organizations, but also those within organizations. What do we do to help construct, to help build, to encourage social capital? Let's take a look at some of the key factors. The first one I want to talk about is needs. It will matter a lot how much people need the help of other people within the organization. And so some people within a social community in general have significant needs, and they need to rely on other people to help meet those needs. Immanuel Kant said at a key point in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals that we all rely often on the love and sympathy of others. And I think what he has in mind there is going beyond simply the kinds of transactions that are involved in making promises and contracts and paying people for goods and services and so on. He means we want help. We need help from other people. And because we all have a need for help, we all have an obligation to help, he thinks. Well, the important part from our point of view is that the existence of needs matters for social capital. If a community of people are all entirely individualistic, if they are entirely self-sufficient and simply have no needs for other people, then there's little opportunity to build social capital within the group. Some neighborhoods are like this. Some neighborhoods are ones where people are constantly doing things for one another. And other neighborhoods are ones where people rarely interact and rarely do things for one another. If we turn around and think about that factor of needs, and then think within a community, within an organization, how do we help to construct social capital? We've got to have people needing each other. If everybody is entirely self-sufficient, if they simply don't need help from anyone else, well then, there isn't going to be much opportunity for interaction. There won't be a culture of helping, of cooperation, of trust, of the kinds of networks that are involved in building social capital and enabling that organization to be more than the sum of its parts. So it's important that people's jobs be interdependent, that their functions within the organization be interdependent. Things have to be structured so that people need one another. If they don't need one another, these kinds of relationships are not going to develop and social capital will not be developed. Let's turn to the second factor, other sources of aid. It will matter how many resources people need, but also where they go to get those resources. If within the community or the organization or the social group, they are relying on one another for help, then social capital is built. That's something that contributes to these norms of reciprocity, of trust. And so it's something that helps build social capital. If, on the other hand, they go outside the community or the organization, then little social capital, if any, is built. And so the availability of aid from outside is something that encourages people to go outside the group for aid 
and it discourages them from seeking aid from other members of the group. Within an organization, then, what can we do to encourage social capital in this respect? We need to get people to look inside the organization for help rather than outside. In a lot of cases, that's going to mean don't look to outside consultants, don't look to outside sources of information, try to develop those sources of information and those consulting resources or other aids internally. It's important to get people working with other people within the group, not going outside the group for what they need. Insofar as you build those relationships within the group, you are building social capital. When you send people outside, you're at least preventing that social capital from being constructed. The third factor I want to talk about is affluence. Part of what's going on here is that the more resources people have available to them, the more they're able to meet their needs on their own. They don't have to look to anyone else inside or outside the group. And so affluence is something that tends to work against social capital. It's easy to notice that in many lower middle class communities, there are extensive networks. People know one another. They're constantly interacting with one another. In upper class neighborhoods, people rarely interact with one another. There's little social capital within the group. And affluence does correlate negatively with social capital. People don't need help from other people because they have their own resources. They can rely on themselves or simply pay for help. They don't need to rely on the love and sympathy of others, as Kant would have put it. Well, affluence then works against social capital. In general, affluence is a good thing. And so it's not as if we want to discourage affluence, but we need to find ways of compensating for that loss of social capital that occurs when people's standard of living improves. You might say that in general, as a community becomes more prosperous, it also loses social capital and becomes less capable of actually accomplishing things together. That can be a serious problem. Now, within an organization, you want to prosper, and so it's not like you want to keep your people poor and unable to help themselves. But on the other hand, you do want to prevent any person or any group of people within the organization from commanding so many resources that they simply do not need the rest of the organization. There are some organizations that are like that, where some group, some part of the organization, is in full control of resources. And they may dole some out to other people, they may keep it to themselves, but in any case, they don't need help from anyone else. That is ultimately destructive to social capital, because people will not rely on one another for help then. That group is in no need of help, they don't have to go outside, they don't have to develop any kinds of relationships of this kind, and so those networks and norms of reciprocity never form. Within an organization, then, how do we help the problem? We prevent any group or any individual person from commanding so many resources that they simply do not need other people. We need to have people needing one another, and that's going to mean sharing resources enough that no one subset controls everything, or control so much that they simply don't need the rest of the group. The next factor is cultural differences. Some cultures stress this kind of interaction, helping one another, constantly interacting, and they stress norms of trust, of cooperation. And so within such communities, it's simply the culture that it's fine to ask other people for help. And when they do, you should certainly help them. And there's a strong ethic of helping one another, a community spirit that is simply part of the culture. Other cultures aren't like that. Other cultures stress self-reliance and autonomy, and they are ones that basically see asking for help as some kind of weakness. Well, that kind of culture is going to be much less likely to develop groups with strong social capital than a group where people really have a simply a cultural norm that they interact with one another, that they share, they help, and in general they engage in these interactions of helping and, you might say, trust building, that form and rely upon strong norms of reciprocity. So a culture can make a huge amount of difference. Within an organization, then, how do we help 
build social capital using that idea of cultural differences. We need to develop a culture of cooperation, a culture of asking one another for things, a culture of helping, a culture of trust. And so it's vital that we have people who are trusting and also trustworthy within the organization. We need to encourage them to interact. We need to build a culture of doing things together, of teamwork, rather than a culture that suggests you should do things on your own and you're largely on your own. It's a competitive environment and people don't work together. Organizations, and even parts of organizations, tend to develop very different cultures in this respect. Some are highly competitive, and others are highly cooperative. So you need to work on building a cooperative environment. The next factor is closure. Now this one takes a little bit of explanation. Some social groups are closed in that people interact mostly with other people within the group. Other social groups are open. Certain interactions are within the group, but most interactions are outside the group. On the campus of a small college, for example, most people spend their time interacting with other people from within that campus community. That tends to build a strong sense of social capital. There are lots and lots of interactions. People are often doing things for one another. Any development where people are betrayed, let's say, and trust turns out to be unjustified, where people choose to defect rather than cooperate, goes around that community very quickly. And so norms of cooperation, of trust, of reciprocity tend to develop very strongly there. However, in environments where people have a lot of interactions with people outside the group, there is little opportunity for that kind of thing to happen. And a key factor here, something that's related to the closure of the group, is the multiplex character of various social relations. If I know you not only at work, let's say, but also because we both belong to a certain organization, uh, or we play on the same softball team, or we play in a musical group together, or we simply attend some concerts together or some movies together, or perhaps we go to the same church or synagogue, or maybe we simply uh, are involved in certain political activities and we know each other through that. All of those are different dimensions of relationships and people develop relationships within those particular dimensions in those aspects of their lives. When I interact with somebody in more than one dimension, it strengthens that relationship tremendously. And some of the capital that's built up in one of those dimensions can then be used in other dimensions. Now, it's not completely fungible. It's not as if um, all of it sort of combines into one thing. Some things are highly specific. People may be strongly competitive in the softball league, for example, but cooperative at work and so on. Still, those kinds of multiplex relations tend to build social capital much faster. So within an organization, how do we build social capital using that factor? Partly, we try to encourage people to interact with other people in the group. We try to organize activities so that people get to know one another outside of the workplace. We try to encourage people to get involved together in community activities so that they're working together in ways that don't involve simply being on the job. The company may sponsor such activities. They may simply point people to certain opportunities for service in the community. A lot of companies devote attention to what is often called corporate social responsibility. And some of that is out of a sense of obligation. Some of it is to help the surrounding community, which in turn can help the company in various ways. But some of it is simply trying to get people to work together outside the workplace, outside so that they can develop multiplex relations and that help build social capital within the company. And so I think it's important to have a kind of community where people are interacting in different dimensions, in different ways. The more that kind of thing happens, the more social capital is built. One factor that's easy to explain is logistics. Within some communities, it's very easy for people to interact. It's easy to communicate. Within other communities, it's hard to communicate and people interact less. Now, the basic relationship here is that the easier it is to communicate, well, then the easier it is to build social capital. So we want to make it easy for people to communicate with one another. 
We want to set up office space and so forth in such a way that we actually encourage interaction rather than discourage it. Now, for this sort of reason, a lot of companies have moved from having individual offices for people, which tends to discourage interaction, and instead opted for workplaces where people simply have cubicles or where in other ways people are put in situations where they are interacting, the open office concept. This has had certain benefits, but it has certain downsides too. For one thing, people feel little sense of privacy. For another, it can be simply a distraction. Yes, it makes it easy for people to interact with you, but it also makes it easy for people to interact around you in ways that are quite distracting. It can be nice for people to have some private workspace where they can focus and not be distracted, but also have sort of group area workspaces where they can easily interact with other people. So some hybrid of individual spaces together with some communal spaces is probably ideal. The next factor is homogeneity. Coleman doesn't talk about this, but Robert Putnam has later investigated social capital and has found this to be a crucial variable. The more people in the group have in common, the easier it is to build social capital. The more diverse the group, however, the more they differ in various characteristics that are relevant to these networks, the more difficult it is for that group to develop social capital. People often say these days, diversity is our strength. Well, be careful. In some respects, perhaps that's true. However, with respect to social capital, diversity can be a problem. Now, of course, all dimensions here are not equal. Some are presumably irrelevant. Suppose a company or an organization decided, ah, to join this group, you have to be a certain height so that everybody is the same height. That is not going to help build social capital. But suppose we want everybody to be a committed baseball fan and we've got an organization dedicated to baseball. That is something that is presumably going to build a kind of homogeneity within the group. Bringing in other people who don't like baseball is not going to strengthen the group. And so we have to be careful about how varied our group is and about how homogeneous it is with respect to the things that matter for that particular group. Now, sometimes I think people focus on kinds of diversity that may make little difference at all. Sometimes they focus on ones that contribute to strength. Sometimes they focus on ones that actually are problematic from the point of view of social capital. We've got to make sure, for example, that people are fully committed to the goals of the organization. Bringing in people who are not committed to the goals, well, that's not going to strengthen the group. That's going to make it harder to build social capital. I can't trust you to work with me on some project and cooperate with me to achieve the goal if you don't even share that goal and don't particularly want it to be achieved or at least don't care about it. So it is important that people do have what Kant called a systematic union of ends. Bringing in people who don't share the ends of the group is not going to help. And there are other ways of thinking about this as well. Often people say, well, a more diverse group is going to bring more diverse approaches and will suggest ideas that otherwise wouldn't have been suggested that may be productive. That's true. On the other hand, groups have to agree on certain decisions. And if diversity in important areas becomes too great, they aren't going to be able to agree. I've been part of organizations where the divisions were strong enough that it was simply difficult for people to reach agreement about things. There were times when it felt as if we were so polarized, so divided on fundamental questions, that the group was bound to split apart. And indeed, there are philosophy departments in the United States that have split apart and have turned into two rather different departments. Sometimes I think the whole country is headed in that direction of simply splitting apart because people no longer have many shared norms, many shared values, and are no longer committed to similar goals. Well, then it looks as if in some respects, yes, people with different backgrounds, for example, different training, may be able to bring in different ideas and strengthen the group. But be careful, people who don't share the same goals or people who have such a different vision of how to accomplish things 
that there is going to be no agreement within the group, no way of reaching a consensus and deciding how to work together. That is not going to help build social capital. In fact, it will tend to destroy it. Putnam, in doing his work, noticed it's not just the case that people in situations like that trust people across the divide less. They trust people within the group less. At first glance, that might seem really puzzling. He says people tend to turtle. They turn within themselves. They simply don't interact much with other people. Well, I think if we think of it from the point of view of social capital, that's easy to understand. If I can trust you to engage with me cooperatively, I am willing to be cooperative. Cooperative strategies in general will be successful and will grow within the group. If, on the other hand, there's a lot of defection going on within the group, it starts making sense for people to adopt defection as a strategy. And when that happens, well, they become untrustworthy, even to members of their own group, even to people who do share the same goals and do share the same vision of how to accomplish them. So diversity can be a multi edged sword. It depends on, well, diversity in what respect exactly, and what does that mean for this particular organization. Coleman, at the end of this list, simply says, well, there are other factors too. What other factors? One of them is surely simply the personalities of the people within the group. Extroverts are going to tend to interact a lot more often than introverts, for example. So a group containing a lot of extroverts will probably build social capital more quickly than a group of introverts. And the same thing may be true with all sorts of other personality characteristics. So it's important to recognize that this is nothing like a comprehensive list. There are all sorts of other things that can contribute to social capital or can make it more difficult to achieve. But from the point of view of ethics, we need to think about ways of using these factors to help build strength in groups. And as individuals within groups, we need to think, when is my behavior something that is contributing to the social capital of the group? And when is my behavior something that is either not contributing when I had the opportunity to, or is actually destructive of social capital?